Welcome back to Season 2 of 12 Days in March. We'll continue in the cardiology section with a two-part series on pericardial disorders. These are high-yield topics in the sense there are only so many ways for the NBME to mess you up. We'll review the major derivatives, and pericardial disorders should be money in the bank. Before proceeding, please remember the pericardium does have visceral and parietal surfaces. I saw a question a few years ago that students totally messed up. It was a question where they used acute pericarditis to test your understanding of basic histology does remind me not to take basic information for granted. So here are the major players. Acute pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, and I highlight this is a physiologic derangement, that is, fluid in the pericardial sac is not the problem. It is the pathophysiologic disturbance caused by that fluid in the sac that forms the basis for tamponade physiology. We'll delve into this further during our presentation. The next player is constricted pericarditis, and finally, we have pericardial effusion. I want to dispense with pericardial effusion straight away. The NBME does not find the presence of an effusion by itself sexy enough for test material. Rather, it is subsumed under other disease headings such as pericarditis or tamponade. So just to be clear, Pericardial effusions are not really tested as a standalone condition. It is associated with a number of disease processes such as autoimmune disorders, but it won't be a target of inquiry if mentioned. For instance, a patient with lupus might have serositis presenting with a pericardial effusion, but the derivative questions will be related to lupus, not the effusion. So let's take this off our list and declutter our slide and our memories. So here are the key disorders, acute pericarditis, cardiac tamponade, and constricted pericarditis. I do want to cut to the chase straight away with necessary background information that will make it easy for you to sort out these conditions. So let's start with acute pericarditis. As noted, virtually all patients will be described with positional chest pain. It won't just be a description of chest pain, they will likely specify that the patient will not want to lie down and more specifically they will want to sit up or are more comfortable sitting upright. In addition, most of the vignettes will describe a friction rub. We'll cover the rub in more detail shortly, but don't be confused if they use the description of a three-phase rub or a scratchy heart sound. It's just their way of being asinine. So this is the key language of acute pericarditis. If these descriptors are not present, you should be thinking about other diagnoses. Remember, when you analyze questions, pay attention to what they tell you and pay attention to what they don't tell you. So here are the classic descriptors for cardiac tamponade. The patient will likely be in shock, defined by life-threatening circulatory failure. Virtually all patients will be described with pulses paradoxus, which will be discussed further in the next video. The one scenario where a patient with tamponade won't have pulses paradoxus is if they are dead. Hopefully you'll make the diagnosis before that happens. And finally, for constricted pericarditis, expect either a pericardial knock or a description of pericardial calcification. Recall, the knock is simply the heart banging into the calcified pericardial sac. So the description of a knock or radiographic description of pericardial calcifications are really describing the same process. Vignettes will also include a predisposing condition associated with constriction, and in the majority, that condition seems to be radiation therapy of the chest that occurred 30 years earlier. And finally, the patient will be described with Kussmaul sign, which is the paradoxical distension of the jugular venous pressure during inspiration. This is a big deal as it reflects the underlying pathophysiologic problem. Blood cannot return to the heart. That is, constricted pericarditis represents a cardiac filling problem, and this pathophysiologic derangement is very nicely reflected by Kussmaul's sign. So we just reviewed the key language of pericardial disorders. When a vignette includes these phrases, they are literally begging you to select a corresponding disorder and or the derivative features to be discussed shortly. So with that background, let's launch into our discussion of the disorders. We'll start with acute pericarditis. Recall the setup for our patient with acute pericarditis. They will be described with positional chest pain with or without the classic friction rub. So what are the scenarios in which you'll encounter a pericarditis question? These are the big three. Infection, acute MI, and late manifestation of cardiac injury. Insofar as infection is concerned, Coxsackie will be the big one. 
Of course, they won't tell you the patient has Coxsackie. They will describe an adult whose children were sick with a viral syndrome including fever, oral vesicles, and tender lesions on the hands and feet. We'll have a patient with classic symptoms and a typical exposure. As an aside, I refer to this exercise as applied virology. It's much easier to learn these bugs in the context of the diseases they cause. The next scenario will be in the post-MI phase. Typically, the patient will have a transmural infarction with inflammation of the overlying epicardial and pericardial surface. The questions will typically relate to the pathologic phase of myocardial injury that being the neutrophilic phase. Recall the macrophage phase occurs on days 5 to 10 and are associated with cardiac or pulmonary muscle rupture. The other derivative may simply relate to the nature of the inflammatory response. The classic description is that of fibrinous pericarditis as opposed to hemorrhagic, pyogenic, or serous. This is an inflammatory response, not a pyogenic infection. Do be aware that pericarditis of any sort can be associated with some degree of myocardial injury. Thus, in the setting of acute pericarditis, the patient may have elevation of troponin, and this would be referred to as myopericarditis. This is not test fodder, but it is a distinct entity from pericarditis complicating acute MI. And finally, we do have the postcardiac injury syndrome. Although I hate to use eponyms, I do prefer to call this Dressler syndrome as this is locked in the medical lexicon as an autoimmune manifestation of cardiac injury. The key consideration is the timeline and inflammatory response. That is, the syndrome represents an immune complex disorder complicating exposure to myocardial antigens. In this manner, the response is delayed for weeks to months following cardiac injury. The immune complexes ultimately elicit the characteristic inflammatory response. Pathologically, this too is described as causing fibrinous pericarditis. So what are the remaining must-knows? They include a clear understanding of the friction rub, and the typical pattern of injury seen on the electrocardiogram. Insofar as the friction rub, it is best heard sitting forward and at the end of expiration. No magic here. This simply brings the heart into close proximity of the chest wall for easy listening. As for the sound, please note it will be described as a heart sound, not a murmur. When they use the phrase sound, always be on the lookout for non-valvular cardiac conditions. As stated earlier, they sometimes describe the sound as triphasic. Those phases simply correlate with atrial and ventricular contraction plus ventricular relaxation. These aren't important per se. They are only relevant so you don't get paranoid and start making up diagnoses. I do include an image of the inflamed cardiac surface so you can bathe in a visual reminder of the process that gives rise to rubs or scratches. And so that brings us to some exciting territory the EKG, and the notion of reciprocal changes. We will review EKG interpretation in other videos, but in this presentation we need to highlight some essential concepts. So when a patient has evidence of myocardial ischemia in the territory of an occluded vessel, the EKG manifests evidence of that injury here represented by ST segment elevation of the anterior or front wall of the heart. And here's some simple math. If the front wall of the heart is evidencing electromotive forces resulting in ST segment elevations, what should happen to those electromotive forces on the back wall of the heart? You got it. There should be depression of those segments. This process is referred to as a reciprocal change. It is an expected and normal occurrence in the setting of myocardial injury from an acutely occluded epicardial vessel. Here is an EKG tracing of a patient showing elevations of the ST segments in leads 2, 3, and AVF. This tracing represents an acute MI occurring in the distribution of an occluded right coronary artery. Note the opposite electromotive finding on the anterior wall in lead V2. The ST segment is depressed and the T wave is inverted. So let's compare and contrast this finding with the expected EKG in a patient with acute pericarditis. So what do we have? ST segments elevated all over the place. Elevation in inferior, lateral, and anterior leads. Where the heck are those reciprocal changes? They're nowhere to be seen. This is the electrocardiographic language of acute pericarditis for the USMLE Step 1 exam. Diffuse ST segment elevations lacking reciprocal changes.
so we can put this one in your files of EKGs to know for step one. FYI, there are other EKG changes, but nothing they would ever test you on. So now let's try our luck at a couple of typical scenarios. A patient presents with acute chest pain. They can't lie back due to pain. They have fever and body aches. Physical exam reveals a three-phase scratchy heart sound. An EKG is shown. What is the most likely cause of this problem? This is the classic presentation of acute pericarditis. They will show the EKG to mess you up. Every student looks at this tracing and sees ST segment elevation. They hear chest pain, so their default diagnosis is an acute MI. You only get this one right if you understand the concept of reciprocal changes. And of course, this dude had positional chest pain in that three-phase scratchy heart sound. When it comes to graphics, students are willing to toss away all their common sense and four sentences in a vignette just to have the opportunity to misinterpret a deceiving graphic. The graphics are more often included to deceive you rather than assist in the diagnosis. So the answer to this question is acute pericarditis and the EKG was included for pure treachery. So they can pick the same scenario and give you the microbiology derivative. Chest pain, sick kid. What was the actual cause of his presentation? You know it is Coxsackie, but that wasn't the choice. What is Coxsackie? A naked RNA virus. I nicknamed this kid Randy to help me remember RNA. You come up with your own nicknames. And so we'll take a break here and resume this section in part two of pericardial disorders. I've summarized the key pieces of information you need to keep handy when answering an acute pericarditis question. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at howard at 12 days in March. Thank you.